This is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting Director of Outreach and Engagement at the Zionist Organization of America. I'd like to welcome you all to this latest installment of ZOA Virtual Programming, Legal Achievements in the Fight Against Campus Antisemitism and More, featuring Susan Tuckman, the Director of ZOA's Center for Law and Justice. <clears throat> The Zionist Organization of America was founded in 1897 and has been at the forefront of pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy for more than 120 years. Through our Center for Law and Justice, Department of Government Relations and the ZOA Campus Department, in the halls of Congress, in the media, and in your neighborhood, ZOA shares truth and facts that support Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital, and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. This is a very exciting program for me personally because not only is Susan a colleague, but she's a personal friend. And I think you're all gonna enjoy this program very much. Susan Tuckman has been the director of the Zionist Organization of America's Center for Law and Justice since 2003. Under Susan's leadership in 2004, the ZOA filed a landmark civil rights complaint on behalf of Jewish students at the University of California at Irvine, challenging years of anti-Semitic harassment and intimidation. In November 2005, Susan testified at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights' first ever hearing on campus anti-Semitism, which led to important government findings and recommendations to protect Jewish college students. The ZOA spearheaded this successful effort to secure legal protection for Jewish students from anti-Semitic harassment and intimidation under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, rallying other national Jewish organizations and bipartisan support from members of Congress. Susan's commitment to defending the rights of Jewish students has led her to work on campuses across this great country including but not limited to UC Irvine, the University of Michigan, Brandeis, Columbia, CUNY, Rutgers, Duke, and the University of North Carolina. There is so much more that Susan does at the ZOA on behalf of Jewish rights, perhaps the subject of a future program. As testimony to the impact of her work, I'm compelled to inform our virtual audience that the Jewish Forward newspaper named Susan one of the 50 most influential members of the Jewish community based on her legal work on behalf of all Jewish students. <clears throat> Before joining the ZOA, Susan was a litigation partner at Hinckley, Allen & Snyder in the law firm's Boston office. She is a graduate of Brandeis University and the Boston University School of Law. A brief personal note, perhaps a bit of a disclaimer. I've been working with Susan for more than two and a half years. She's one of the brightest, kindest and most insightful people I know. Her commitment to supporting Israel and defending the rights of Jewish students is matched by her loyalty to her personal values and to those she loves and cares about. I'm honored to work with Susan and I'm grateful for our friendship. Hello, Susan. Hello, Alan, and thank you for bringing me close to tears at the very beginning of this webinar. It's, it's such a, a privilege for me to be here with you tonight and with all of our friends and supporters. I'm really looking forward to the evening. So I guess I'll start the same way we've started all of our conversations these past few weeks by saying that I hope that you and your family remain safe and healthy in these very strange and troubling times. Susan, I have many attorneys in my family. I have many attorneys that are friends and <clears throat> I don't know one attorney in my own sphere that works in the nonprofit sector and certainly not in support of Jewish rights, Jewish students uh, and uh, Jewish students. Um, I know you went from a career in litigation. How in heaven's name did you go from that career to a career supporting Israel and the Jewish people at the ZOA? Well, you make it sound like it was a stretch, um, but really it, it wasn't. Um, I have always worked um, in, in jobs that promoted the public interest, both in college and in law school. Um, I was always geared to doing that kind of work. Um, and toward the end of my law school career, I really felt like I needed to broaden my 
perspective a little bit and I figured I'd spend one or two years um, trying out uh, private practice in a law firm. Um, so after I graduated and I did a judicial clerkship, um, I went to a law firm and lo and behold, I ended up loving the work there. Um, I did the traditional work that you would do as a litigation associate in a big law firm, but I also was privileged to do public interest work uh, in a private law firm setting. Um, a lot of my work uh, related to mental health issues, I represented uh, private schools for special needs children, and I also represented um, in addition to doing regular law firm practice, the typical law firm practice, I also represented parents and families uh, who had children who they were seeking um, safe and appropriate mental health treatment for. And so a large part of my job was enforcing their right to treatment. Um, when I applied for the job at the ZOA, the ZOA was looking for someone with a litigation background, which I had. And now I am spending my time continuing to do civil rights work, but I'm doing it on behalf of the Jewish people. That's fantastic. Susan, I think I remember that one of the first cases you worked on when you came to ZOA was the Zivotofsky passport case. I don't think campus advocacy was even on your radar. Could you tell the audience how this became such an integral part of your work? And if you don't mind, you can speak about your first experiences defending Jewish students. Sure, um, you're right. When I came to the ZOA, um, I was, I had a full plate. I had a lot of projects to work on and first and foremost was the case that you referred to, the Zivotofsky case. And many people in the audience might remember it because it's a case that went up to the US Supreme Court twice. Um, it was a case that sought to enforce a federal law that gave American citizens born in Jerusalem the right to have Israel listed as their birthplace on their passports and other official documents. And it sounds sort of funny that we would even need a federal law to enforce that right. Uh, but before that law was passed, if you were an American citizen born in Jerusalem, your passport listed no country of birth. Um, you were simply identified by your city of birth. So that was the very first project that I worked on. And I'm proud to tell you that ZOA was the only Jewish organization to file its own lawsuit to enforce that federal right. Um, and then we went on to assist um, the Zivotofsky family in their lawsuit. Um, but Campus anti-Semitism, when I came to the ZOA, was not on my plate of projects. I had no idea that there was even a problem on campus. Um, but I guess it was a few months into my job at the ZOA. Um, you, you know, when you're working at the ZOA, you get every article, every email relating to Israel and the Jewish people. And I was reading a bunch of articles about problems that Jewish students were facing on a campus in California. This was the University of California at Irvine. And this was uh, the problems related to Jewish students being harassed. They were feeling like they were being targeted on campus. And this was really news to me. And sheerly out of curiosity, um, I reached out to the president of the pro-Israel group at Irvine. She was quoted in a number of the articles that I was reading and I tracked her down and she was more than happy to speak to me about what she and other Jewish students were facing at Irvine. And I spoke with her. She connected me to other students who connected me to even more students. And what I was hearing, this, this, the problems related to the graduation ceremony that were referenced in the articles turned out to be the tip of the iceberg. These kids were facing unrelenting anti-Semitism at Irvine. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Um, speakers and programs every couple of weeks that were viciously attacking Israel and even attacking Jews. 
um, programs like um, one title was Israel the Fourth Reich, one title was A World Without Israel. There were speakers on the Irvine campus who were calling Jews Nazis, comparing us to Satan. Uh, one speaker discussed good Jews versus bad Jews, and the bad Jews were the Jews who supported Israel. And these speakers were speaking right in front of the student center, so they were impossible to avoid. Um, and not surprisingly, all of these verbal attacks ended up escalating into physical violence at Irvine. Um, there were Jewish students who were physically threatened, Jewish students who were actually physically assaulted. And this is what I was hearing um, from my desk at the ZOA from students across the country from me. Um, the students described just really heartbreaking impact that this was all having on them. Um, kids who were afraid to wear a kippah, Star of David, um, kids who were afraid to affiliate not only with the pro-Israel group, but even with Hillel, they, would, they were afraid they'd become targets. Um, there were students whose studies were affected, they couldn't concentrate. Uh, and there were students who literally felt like pariahs on their campuses. They just stayed away from campus as much as possible because they didn't feel welcome and they didn't feel safe. So I was hearing all of this from the students. I was also hearing every which way they were trying to get these problems addressed. They were, in my view, heroic. Um, they had gone repeatedly to the administration for help. They had gone to outside organizations for help. Um, nothing had worked. Um, the problems persisted. And I suggested that they consider supporting a legal action. Um, I, I thought that it would make sense to enforce, try to enforce their civil rights to a safe and welcoming campus environment under the law. And the law that I was suggesting that we use is, it's a federal law, it's called Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, many of you in the audience may have heard of this law. It was passed back in 1964, um, really to address uh, racial discrimination, but it's, it's got a broader mandate than that. Um, it essentially says that if you receive federal funding, and all public universities do, and most privates do as well. If you receive federal funding, then you are required to make sure that your programs and activities are free from racial and ethnic discrimination. So I proposed that we use Title VI to enforce Jewish students' right to a safe campus environment. And there was, there was a wrinkle to all of this because um, historically the federal agency that enforces this federal law was not interpreting the law to protect Jewish students. The federal agency is called the United States Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights or OCR for short. And OCR had a, really a common sense reason for not enforcing Title VI to protect Jews. Uh, in OCR's view, the language of the law says it prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. Um, what is lacking in the language of the law is protection from discrimination based on religion. And OCR viewed Jews strictly as a religious group and therefore outside the protections of the law. Um, our argument was that, yes, we Jews are a religious group, but we're an ethnic group as well. Um, we don't just share a religion. We share a, a language. We share a homeland. We share a culture, traditions, and ancestry, all of the qualities that make us not just a religious group and an ethnic group, too, that should entitle us to the protections of Title VI. So what we ended up doing was students backed this legal effort. ZOA filed a Title VI action with the Office for Civil Rights against the University of California at Irvine. 
and it turned out to be a groundbreaking case. Uh, it was the first case of campus anti-Semitism that the federal government ever investigated under Title VI. And that really was the beginning of my uh, fight against campus anti-Semitism, which unfortunately, I would say, we are still vigorously fighting today. Susan, we can come back to that. Uh, Title VI is obviously um, an issue that you've been dealing with for a long time, but before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit about some of the students that you've interacted with? It must take a lot of courage for them to, to stand up and be accounted as uh, defenders of their civil liberties. And at the same time, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the reactions of college and university administrations have been to our outreaches on behalf of the students. You know, the students the students are the heroes, I have to say. We at ZOA could not do this legal work without their input, without their support. Um, and it's, they're heroic because it's not easy to come forward. Uh, it's scary to come forward. Um, these students understandably are not at school to be uh, legal advocates. They're there to learn, they're there to uh, engage and to socialize, um, and uh, and they don't want to become targets from anti-Israel groups at the school, or even targets uh, of professors or administrators who see them as troublemakers. Um, so we applaud and appreciate every single student who has come forward to work with us because we couldn't do the work without all of them. Um, and I, I have to say the, the work that I do with these, I call them kids, they're not really kids. Um, the work that I get to do with these young people is really the most gratifying aspect of my job. Um, I can't tell you how often I, you know, when I speak at various places around the country and somebody will come up to me and say, and, and mind you, I don't always meet my students in person, many times that I'm working with them by phone or email. And it's so gratifying when I'm someplace in Michigan or in California or in Florida, and a, a, somebody will come up to me and say, I'm so and so and you helped me at my school. Um, and really, I'm the one who needs to thank them because I couldn't do the work without them. Um, and, you know, it's, they, they try on their own, typically, before they get to us, they try on their own to resolve these problems uh, by themselves. Uh, they do the best that they can do. And, you know, when I talk about this work, I often share a story that has stayed with me uh, for the many years since I've worked on the Irvine case. Um, I worked with one student in particular um, all of whom were heroic, but this one student actually went so far as to, uh, to write to the chancellor at Irvine and to numerous other administrators there. Um, the email that she wrote to them was heartbreaking. She begged them to protect her. She feared for her physical safety. Um, and she wrote to several administrators only one responded to her. Um, and what stuck out with me from this experience was the administrator who responded didn't tell her what he was going to do to protect her safety. Uh, he actually encouraged her to visit the counseling center to work out her feelings. That's what he wrote to her. Um, and that story so resonated with me because to me, it typifies how college administrators tend to respond to these problems. They don't see campus anti-Semitism as a problem that they have the obligation to address. They put it on the Jewish students and say, well, you learn to deal with it. And we at ZOA don't see it that way. We say, you have the legal obligation to address it, and we're going to hold you to it. And, and Susan, the administrators, you just told one example of where an administrator's actions are actually, in my own estimation, deplorable. 
Do we ever get administrations that are cooperative from the start? Are they sensitive to our issue? Well, I hate to be pessimistic, but we often, it's not that they're not sympathetic. Um, we often get a sympathetic response from administrators we reach out to, but it, it's sympathy, but combined with there's really nothing we can do. Um, they cite to principles of free speech, the First Amendment, academic freedom. These, of course, are all principles that we at ZOA support. But our response to the administrators is, you would never respond this way if an African-American student were being threatened or harassed, or a gay student, or a woman. Uh, and, and you shouldn't. You would take those problems seriously and you would do something about them. And we say to those administrators, treat Jewish students in the same equitable way as that you would treat any other group that was being targeted. Right. Susan, um, I have a student at Rutgers and I know sometimes it's, it's, it's almost natural and easy um, if you have a vested interest. So soon after I joined ZOA, it was a time when there were three professors at Rutgers who were promoting hatred of Jews in Israel. And it was easy for me to really dig into that issue. But you and ZOA take this fight to any school where Jewish students are attacked. What is your inspiration and why should our listeners be invested even if they don't have students at a university where there's an issue? Well, I'm inspired for a number of reasons. I'm inspired as a Jew, and I'm also inspired as a parent. Um, I think it is completely unacceptable for any Jewish student to be afraid to be proudly Jewish and proudly pro-Israel anywhere, but especially on a college campus. So the notion that that is uh, that, that those students, that there are students out there who are afraid to express their Jewish identity, afraid to be proudly Zionist, uh, that's just unacceptable to me as a Jew, uh, as a human being. Um, and, and, you know, when I started this work, my, my children were young, um, but I have children who are college age and one recently out of college and the notion that my children could be made to feel afraid because they're Jewish, because they love the state of Israel, is, is unacceptable to me. And I'm determined to do something about it. And fortunately, I work for an organization that feels exactly the same way I do. That's, that's great. Um, you know, you're always so humble about the next issue that I'm going to bring up, but today, with our audience, I'm not particularly compelled to concede to your humility. Um, we've, we've discussed this a lot, and the truth is that you and ZOA conceived the strategy to protect Jewish students under Title VI of the Civil Rights Code. And if my memory serves correctly, and I'm pretty sure it does, there were very few even in the Jewish advocacy community in our shared community that supported your work. These many years later, I think it's fair to say that without your work and ZOA's work, um, that in this case, there may not have been an executive order combating anti-Semitism for President Trump to sign this past December. Can you share with the audience some of the obstacles you've overcome and some of the successes that led to this monumental order? And I applaud you for this in advance of your answer. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, when I came to the ZOA, um, I had come from private law practice. I had never worked uh, in the Jewish organizational world before. Um, and maybe this sounds naive, but I actually came in thinking that, especially when it came to the problem of anti-Semitism and making sure that our kids and our grandkids felt safe being Jewish and pro-Israel on a college campus, I figured that would be an issue that all of us would be united on and fighting together uh, 
on that issue, and it 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 didn't it didn't happen that way, unfortunately. Um, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, after after ZOA filed its Title VI action against UC Irvine, um, we were we were out there pretty much on our own, I would have to say. Um, there were Jewish organizations that publicly condemned our legal effort. And there were Jewish organizations that denied that campus anti-Semitism was a problem or minimized the problem. And, um, and I'm proud to say that despite that response, um, ZOA kept up that fight. We kept going um, and we, you know, it wasn't an easy battle. We, um, the, the Irvine case took years and years to resolve. Um, and it became clear to us based on how the government was responding to the legal action that the government was not really enforcing Title VI to protect Jewish students. And it was ZOA that fought a six year battle to make sure that Jewish students would finally be protected under this federal law. It took us six years. It was a battle that ZOA led. I will tell you that eventually other Jewish organizations did come on board to, to work with us and support us, um, but it was not right away. And it, eventually this battle that we led, um, we achieved the result that we were looking for um, Jewish students were finally protected under a federal law that had been protecting other ethnic groups and other racial groups for close to 50 years by that point. Um, so that, that was a major, major achievement. Um, and then we just kept going and we, we went on and fortunately and proudly we have gone on to do other legal work that I think has truly helped protect Jewish students on campuses across the country. Um, you mentioned Rutgers a few minutes ago. Um, Rutgers is in my home state of New Jersey, and we filed a Title VI action against Rutgers. This is back in 2011. Like the Irvine case, this was a situation where Jewish students were being harassed and discriminated against. Um, I don't know that we have time to go into the details of that case, but um, students had tried, like the Irvine stu students, to resolve the case on their own. Um, their efforts, unfortunately, were not successful, and they agreed to back ZOA's Title VI action against Rutgers. We filed the case in 2011. The case took three years before we finally got a decision. These cases are typically resolved in six months. It took three years. Despite all of the evidence that we submitted to the government, um, the government dismissed our case. This is in 2014. ZOA filed a timely appeal of that decision. Four years later, Four years later, we got a decision on the appeal. Um, and it was a great decision for our Rutgers case, but also for Jewish students on campuses across the country. Um, the decision from the Office for Civil Rights was first to reopen our Rutgers case. The government agreed to examine evidence that it had ignored in the earlier investigation. But the good news for Jewish students on campuses everywhere was that the, go the government said that from now on, when it is considering Title VI cases alleging anti-Semitism and deciding those cases, it's now going to use a definition of anti-Semitism that was adopted. It's called the International Holocaust uh, Alliance, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And it's a definition that I think about 30 countries around the world use. 
uh, our State Department has been using it for years, and ZOA has been urging for years, we've been urging the Office for Civil Rights to use this definition because it happens to be excellent. Um, it recognizes that, of course, not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, but some criticism does cross the line into anti-Semitism. Um, and now that the government has this tool, before the decision in the Rutgers case, the Office for Civil Rights had no guidelines about how to understand anti-Semitism, how it's expressed today. Now, as a result of the ZOA's case against Rutgers, the government has this very useful guidance to understand how anti-Semitism is expressed today. And with that understanding, um, the government will better enforce the law to protect Jewish students. That's great. Thank you for that answer. Your tenacity is unbelievable. Um, I'm gonna ask a follow-up that's also reflected in one of the questions that we've gotten. So um, in an op-ed this past January, I think it was in the Times of Israel website, you stated, and I'm gonna quote, the executive order does not define Jews as a race or nationality, and it will not infringe on the right to free speech. Why did you need to print this op-ed? And in the context of the extensive work you have done in this field, can you help us understand the executive order? Sure, and just to clarify, what I think you're referring to is actually a rather lengthy letter to the editor responding to an article that was critical of President Trump's executive order. Um, and this was an executive order that President Trump issued on December 11th. Um, it's an order to combat anti-Semitism. And very simply, it expresses our government, the president's and his administration's commitment to fight anti-Semitism, including on our college campuses. Um, and unfortunately, what ended up happening is that people, there were many misconceptions about what this executive order actually says and does. Um, and some of, those, some of those misconceptions, I believe, were uh, engendered by what the media was writing about the executive order. Uh, the order very simply uh, expresses the government's, the administration's commitment to fighting anti-Semitism. Uh, it commands all federal agencies that enforce Title VI to enforce it to protect Jewish students uh, against discrimination based on their Jewish ancestry or ethnicity, uh, which as, as the audience already knows by now, uh, the Office for Civil Rights is already doing that. But President Trump made it clear that all federal agencies that enforce Title VI have to follow that same mandate. The other thing that, that the president's executive order said was that when federal agencies are enforcing Title VI, they have to use that IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Again, we know from this webinar that the State Department uses that definition already. We know that now, as a result of the Rutgers case, the Office for Civil Rights uses that definition. But the executive order just made it a command of the president to all federal agencies. That's what the executive order says. The intent and I think the effect will be better protections for Jewish students. Um, and, and, and better support for our fight against anti-Semitism. What some critics were saying is that President Trump was trying to categorize Jews as a separate race or nationality. It simply is not true. The order doesn't say anything like that. Um, the second claim uh, among critics is that this executive order is going to trample on our right to free speech. It's going to prevent people from criticizing Israel. And again, it's not going to do anything of the sort. Um, Title VI has always been enforced subject to uh, the First Amendment. That's a requirement. Um, and it's going to continue to be. And if anyone reads the executive order, 
the order specifically says that federal agencies have to act consistent with the requirements of the First Amendment. So we have really, I think that letter that you referred to from ZOA was really trying to clarify uh, what this executive order does and dispel the lies that are out there about it. Thank you for that. Susan, before we get to uh, some questions from the audience, um, I have one more question for you. Uh, you and I have done a lot of programs together, um, uh, speaking to defending the rights of Jewish students on campus. And we frequently hear what we believe we've shared this is one of the most important questions that, that we need you to answer. And that is, what can parents and grandparents do to help fight the scourge of anti-Semitism on campus? Such a good question, Alan. And, um, and you know, I thought a lot about this now as a, a professional and now a parent too. And I'll just throw a few ideas out there to the audience. Um, the first one being really encourage your children and your grandchildren to be proud Jews and proud Zionists on their college campuses. Don't be afraid to be who you are and say what you believe. Um, there are so many ways to get involved uh, Jewishly on campus, uh, to get involved in Israel advocacy on campus. Encourage your children and grandchildren to pick a way and do it and explore their Jewish identity and explore their connection to Israel. Um, if by chance, you know, your kids or your grandkids don't have a pro-Israel group on campus, we at ZOA can help them start one. So come to us um, and we can help you form a group, um, contribute ideas for speakers and programs. So, so that's the very first thing. The second thing I would say is um, keep the lines of communication open with your kids and grandkids about what's happening on their campuses, both uh, outside the classroom and inside the classroom. Ask them what they're hearing. What are student groups saying? Um, what are their professors saying in the classroom? Um, please don't think if your child or your grandchild is uh, a graphic design major um, that they're not hearing professors speak in a hostile way about Israel. Um, any professor that has an anti-Israel agenda, in my experience, often uses the classroom as a platform to promote that anti-Israel agenda, even if the subject matter of the course has nothing to do with Israel. Um, we had a, a parent come to us about a year ago whose daughter wa was taking a mandatory freshman writing seminar. Um, and you would think Israel would never come up in that kind of a seminar, but it did. Um, they were focusing on what's called the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of words and images. Um, and the class was assigned a graphic novel that not just viciously attacked Israel, it viciously attacked Jews. Um, so no matter what your child or your grandchild is majoring in, find out what they're learning in the classroom, find out what their teachers are saying. Um, and then I'll just, I'll leave with this one and that is to encourage your children and grandchildren to speak up. If they experience an anti-Semitic incident, if they witness one, um, it's hard to speak up if they're not comfortable, please encourage them to come to us. Um, that is what we're here for. We're here to educate, we're here to advocate, we're here to support your kids and grandkids. But to deny there's a problem when there is one, to put your heads in the sand, um, in our experience, that just doesn't work. Um, I see that when people do that, the problems, they don't get addressed. In fact, they, they worsen. Um, so encourage your kids and grandkids to speak up and you as parents and grandparents and taxpayers, you should speak up as well. 
Um, don't hesitate to let administrators know uh, that you're aware of a problem and you expect it to be addressed. Uh, don't hesitate your, uh, your representatives in Congress to know, um, even on the state level, let them know. And also you should feel free to come to us with any questions, with any concerns, um, because it, that's exactly why, why we are here to, to, to assist you. So uh, that, that's just some uh, little nuggets of advice. There's probably much more, but. Well, I'm, I'm going to add one if it's all right, Susan, and then it'll dovetail into our first question from one of our attendees. And one, one other strategy that you and I have discussed is that <clears throat> alumni dollars can be withheld in defense or in support of our cause. And since money is so important to colleges, and it dovetails into the first question, and it is <clears throat> how much anti-Israel campus activity is due to foreign money directly or indirectly subsidizing the faculty or student activists? You know, I, 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 it's a great question and I don't know, obviously there is a strong correlation, but I can't answer the question as to how much is affecting what's happening on campus. I mean, that is certainly a factor, but I will also tell you that much of the anti-Israel sentiment, or a large part of the anti-Israel sentiment, we often see it coming from Jewish professors and Israeli professors. And that's often the response that we get when we complain about these problems to administrators. Well, the professor is Jewish or the professor is from Israel. Yes, foreign money obviously is affecting what our kids and grandkids are learning in the classroom, but it's not just coming from, it's not just stemming from that. Um, it's coming from many sources, including from among our own community. Uh, Len Getz asks, and it, it also leads to what you just said, is most of the anti-Semitism on campus coming from Islamist students? Most of the anti-Semitism is coming from a group called Students for Justice in Palestine. Now there are uh, newer groups that have uh, partnered with Students for Justice in Palestine or SJP, like a group called Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, in my experience, many of the SJP members some of, many of the SJP members are Americans. Uh, some of the members are Jews. Um, and some of them are uh, Christians, Muslims. Um, so it's very, it's very, very hard to categorize it. Um, as I mentioned, Jewish Voice for Peace is now becoming a very strong ally of SJP on campuses across the country. And the name sounds very appealing, right? Jewish Voice for Peace. It sounds sort of innocent and it, aren't we all Jews for peace? But JVP is as viciously anti-Israel as SJP and partners with SJP to uh, harass and intimidate Jewish students who support the state of Israel. Okay, I'm going to put together two questions that speak to the same topic, and I apologize to those in the audience. I am reading the questions, so forgive me. Um, these come from Eugene Greenstein and, and Emmanuel Kahan. I'm going to put them together. Why is there a double standard when it comes to Jews? They always seem to treat Jews differently. And why are so many Jews refusing to consider Jews as members of an ethnic group? Why there is a double standard is the question that I've been asking myself for all these years. Um, because in my experience, there is a double standard. Uh, I, I believe that it is because Jews are perceived to be white, um, members of a privileged class. Um, th they can't possibly be subjected to discrimination because they're members of that group. Um, I, I, I really think that that's what it is about. And I also think that 
it's somehow connected to the way that Israel is perceived. Israel is perceived as, uh, you know, the white colonialist oppressors, um, oppressing the, uh, the indigenous Palestinian Arabs. That's sort of the narrative. And I think that many college administrators have a very tough time seeing Jews as targets. Um, even college leaders who are Jews themselves, in my experience, have had that problem. And ZOA does not hesitate to point out to college leaders that there is a double standard. We point out example after example where university leaders have taken strong and decisive action when African-American students have been targeted, when women have been targeted. We support that strong, decisive action. We just say, you have to do the same thing. Treat Jewish students no differently. Make sure that they receive the same protections that you afford to other minority groups. Thanks, Susan. Um, Michael Goldstein says, as general counsel for proclaiming justice to the nations, he's been working to pass the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act in state legislators and state legislatures in order to get the uh, IHRA definition enshrined in law. He asks, if you're working on it now and would you like to collaborate, and if you don't want to go into it in detail, Susan, we can certainly put you in touch with Mr. Goldstein offline after the, after the seminar or the webinar. So. Well, I would love to speak to Mr. Goldstein, and I hope he knows that the ZOA has also been advocating for the passage of the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. Um, I've been working on it, and I've been working on it with my colleagues in our government relations department in Washington, D.C. So yes, for sure, we should all be collaborating on this very important objective. So, so Michael, this is Alan speaking. Natalie or I will get you in touch with Susan after the webinar, probably tomorrow sometime. Uh, Robert Walski asks Susan, has the recent executive order by President Trump helped in the fight for ethnic rights for Jews? In my view, absolutely. I think that um, we have already seen the government being more responsive um, more vigorously enforcing Title VI. And, and I will give you just two recent examples, two, two recent achievements uh, from ZOA's work. Um, last spring, um, two universities co-sponsored ac an academic conference. I'm putting academic in quotes, but it was an academic conference on Gaza. It was a three-day conference that was co-sponsored by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and by Duke University. Um, the conference was um, funded in part with our taxpayer money, which made it a problem. Um, but also the conference was hostile to Israel one-sided against Israel and actually crossed the line into anti-Semitism. Um, during the conference, they featured a rapper who got up on stage and he proudly announced that he was going to be singing his anti-Semitic song. And he encouraged everybody at the conference, and I, I'm assuming in the audience, the conference included students and faculty and administrators, um, he encouraged the audience to sing along with him to his anti-Semitic song. Um, he said, think of Mel Gibson when you sing it. Mel Gibson being the actor who went off on that horrific um, drunken rant against Jews several years ago. Think about Mel Gibson, he said, go that anti-Semitic. That's what he said. And you can watch this on YouTube. You can see what happened on YouTube. Um, the audience joined in with this rapper singing, oh, I'm in love with a Jew, and laughing like it was some big funny joke. Uh, and it was horrifying. Um, we brought this conference and what happened with this rapper to the attention of the Office for Civil Rights shortly after the incidents occurred. Um, and the Office for Civil Rights immediately responded. 
Um, and the Office for Civil Rights opened an investigation into both universities. And the uni before the government could complete its investigation of the universities under Title VI, both universities came to the government and, and proposed uh, resolving the issues before there could be a final determination. The government agreed to do that. And both universities entered into what's called a resolution agreement. They each have one with the Office for Civil Rights. And the resolution agreement sets out specific steps that each university has to take uh, over the next several academic years. Uh, steps like issuing a statement, um, uh, expressing zero tolerance for anti-Semitism on campus. They have to beef up their policies about anti-Semitic harassment. They have to beef up their training on anti-Semitic harassment. Um, they have to hold a meeting so that if anyone in the university community is facing anti-Semitism, for the next couple of years, there has to be a meeting at which these uh, issues can be uh, brought up and addressed. And all of these steps are being taken under the monitoring of the Office for Civil Rights so that if the agreement is violated in any way, um, the government will, will react and may resume its investigation. So we filed that case last April and I would say uh, we got the uh, notification of these resolution agreements. I think it was in December. Um, so that is, I think, a timely and forceful response to the complaint that we made. And I think this is an indication of how the Office for Civil Rights is responding to anti-Semitism these days. Fantastic. Um, Andrea Spindell writes that in Canada, her organization, the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, is assembling a team to bring action, legal and political, to challenge Israel Apartheid Week and BDS committees on campus that are anti-Semitic and to get administrations and boards to adopt IHRA. And she asks if ZOA will join, provide expert opinion, history, etc. So again, I would just give you the opportunity to tell Andrea that we will be in touch with her. Absolutely, so absolutely. I, and Alan, you know, if there's anybody out there who, you know, if we don't have time to get to your question, or maybe you don't want to pose a question in this forum, and you do want to be in touch with, with us about an issue, whether you want us to get involved in a particular project, or you have a particular concern about maybe your child or a particular campus, never hesitate to reach out. I am so often contacted by email and alerted to problems by email by concerned members of the community. So we really welcome that input from all of you. Thank you, Susan. I'm looking for one more comment. Just let me take one moment because I scanned, I seem to have lost it, but I'll find it. And it was from one of our own Regional Directors, Sharona Whistler in Florida. Hi, Sharona. Hi, Sharona. Sharona says, I heard Elon Carr, Special Envoy to Combating Anti-Semitism, say that one of his three principal points in combating anti-Semitism is condemning it. He correctly stated that it's a huge mistake when university presidents don't condemn anti-Semitism on their campuses, citing free speech issues. And Sharona then asks, why do so many university presidents miss the opportunity to proudly stand up against hate in condemning anti-Semitism on their campus when they would be applauded for doing so? Sharona, if only I had the answer to that question, I don't. Um, and I can tell you that for as long as the ZOA has been doing this work, standing up for Jewish students on campus, pretty much the first thing we ask university leaders to do, especially when they bring up the First Amendment to us, we say exercise your own First Amendment rights. Speak up and condemn anti-Semitism on your campus and condemn the perpetrators. Exercise your own First Amendment rights. Sometimes we've seen university leaders do just that. Sometimes after a little bit of encouragement and goading, they will do it, but it's not being done enough. 
And that's a huge problem because if they stay silent, university leaders are sending the message to SJP and to Jewish students that anti-Semitism on campus is tolerable and it's not worth condemning. Um, and we can't afford to send that message to anybody. So um, Sharon is exactly right that it's so important for university leaders to speak up and it's pretty much the first thing that ZOA demands they do. Susan, we're going to close with this last question because we're running out of time and I think it's going to give you an opportunity to speak to such an important facet of ZOA's work and that being ZOA campus. And Robert Walski asks, do you have strategies for students on campus to band together to support each other as they fight each episode of anti-Semitism? We do, and I, I, I am not the person who is working on campus, but we do, this gives me an opportunity to tout our amazing campus department. It's called ZOA Campus. Um, we have campus professionals in regions around the United States. Our professionals are younger people. Um, they were all uh, pro-Israel advocates on their campuses when they were in college. Um, and they know what these students are facing these days, and they know the effective strategies to fight back. Um, and our campus professionals are working with students on campuses all across the country, um, bringing speakers to campus, educating them about Israel, educating them about Zionism. And when students are facing boycott, divestment, and sanctions initiatives, BDS initiatives, um, or other anti-Israel sentiment on campus. Um, our campus professionals are the first ones, they're on the front lines with these students, helping them to fight back, and they do a great job. Um, I wanna say that they are often my first introduction to students who need my help. Um, these students don't, owe, they don't know me, um, and many times it's because our campus professionals have built such strong and trusting relationships with the students that they work with that they, those students then feel comfortable working with me. Um, so it's really the, um, the campus department, ZOA campus, that, uh, that really is on the front lines with students. And I would encourage all of you to take a look at um, our campus website. I think it's still called zoacampus.org. You're right. If you go on the website, there is there are so many incredible resources for students, resources that I use in my own work, um, fact sheets, information about anti-Israel uh, speakers on campus, um, information about BDS, important information about what Israel is and what Zionism is, um, all kinds of resources that are there to educate students and support students. So um, ZOA campus is another, you know, critical piece of the ZOA's work. Susan, I, I, I suspect that if uh, we asked Natalie to open the microphones, which we're not going to, that there would be a standing ovation with a lot of applause. Um, you know, our work can be challenging and frustrating, difficult and lonely. Um, and the professionalism and sophistication that you bring adds so much to our credibility to our cause. I hope and pray that you continue your inspired work. ZOA, Israel, the Jewish people all owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude. And I know I am so very thankful, not only that we're colleagues, but that we are truly friends. You and your family, please stay safe and healthy. And I wish you Hatzlacha always, and please say that you will join us again if asked. Alan, my pleasure. I hope for those of you who are um, already ZOA friends and supporters, thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Uh, for those of you who are new to us um, and are learning a little bit more about us, um, we welcome you and we hope you will support our work. I really, I. I'm looking out there and I see some of my wonderful colleagues and I'm so privileged to work with all of you and so privileged to work for the ZOA. So thank you all so much. 
So let me close with by letting everybody know there's a lot more virtual programming on the ZOA schedule. The next installment is our next series in our book club with ZOA's Director of Special Projects, Liz Burney. She's going to be with author Farrell Block. That's scheduled for tomorrow at 1 p.m. There's still time to register. For more upcoming programming, please continue to watch your ZOE emails. Check our Facebook page. Look for programs soon to be aired on ZOA's YouTube channel. ZOA's work continues even in this difficult time, so if you're able, please visit our website at zoa.org, click the Donate Now button, and support our work financially. We wish you all safety and health always. This ends our program, and until next program, be safe and be well.